All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my affiliation is to the Corpus of Romanesque Sculpture in Britain and Ireland. And if anybody wants to get involved in this exciting project, I've left a few leaflets over on the side that you can have a look at. Right, Glastonbury then. In the course of this project, I examined and photographed 83 carved stones. Carved, I decided, between the conquest and 1184, which is the Glastonbury definition of the Romanesque period. I only found three types of stone. Blue Lias, Dalting, and Dundry. Only one piece of Dundry. The Dundry, obviously, from a centripetal <coughs> chevron arch, and the Dalting, an assortment of um, corbels, grave markers, grave markers recarved as corbels, and parts of doorways of various dates between the early 12th century and shortly before the fire. But by far the most spectacular of the Romanesque carved stones in the Abbey store are 40 sherds of blue lias, finely carved with vegetal ornament in a crisp, precise style with a polished surface. Foliage stems are fleshy and decorated with surface patterns, beading, nail head, or zigzag. And there's liberal use of beaded clasps. Leaves and flowers are either furled or multi-lobed and have a similar repertoire of decoration. A common, and I found very attractive feature, is the berry cluster. While some pieces have lion masks, or parts of human figures, a head, a hand, a lower leg. Unfortunately, none of these body parts contain features associated with a specific iconography. I only have time today to cover two aspects of this fascinating sculpture. So in tune with the theme of the symposium, I shall concentrate first on the discovery of the material and then on its incorporation into the art historical discourse. Right, well, the earliest mention of this group of stones is found in Richard Warner's History of the Abbey of Glaston, published in 1826, which illustrates two stones that, he said, have been dug up some years ago in the area of the great church and are now in the collection of Mr. Reeves. One is now in the Glastonbury Abbey Museum, accessioned as S519, while the other, distinguished by what appears to be the body of a horse tangled in foliage, has not been identified. <coughs> a search for it in and around Abbey House by Dr. Green and the author failed to yield positive results. Let's go back to the plate. Well, I read a quote from the description of these stones, written in 1826. It is not within the compass of human art to produce a more exquisite piece of stone engraving, for it cannot be called chiseling, than the originals from which this plate was executed. I love the precision of that. <laughs> The grace of the design, the richness and complexity of the pattern, the accuracy and sharpness of the lines on these stones are all equally surprising. Nor is our wonder lessened when we recollect that this marvellous tracery is worked upon a substance of uncommon hardness and most difficult polish, the blue lias. The fragments are about eight inches in height and appear to have formed part of a splendid frieze. There can be no doubt that such a costly and elaborate piece of workmanship must originally have been intended as the decoration of that member of the cathedral which was most sacred and honorable in the estimation of the inmates of Glaston Abbey. This would, of course, be the high altar of the Blessed Virgin, to whose honor the whole pile was dedicated. Then the rest of the caption, the rest of the caption is an account of what such a high altar must have looked like, based on a 17th century description of the high altar of Durham Cathedral, and is therefore totally irrelevant here. 
Neither should the misidentification of the two stones as belonging to a frieze be dwelt upon. But Warner did make a few important points. His appreciation of the workmanship includes the observation that it is more like engraving than chiseling, i.e. the style is linear and very precisely done. He also correctly identified the stone as blue lias and described its properties from the sculptor's viewpoint. The next discovery was a capital now in the Salisbury and South Wiltshire Museum to which it was presented by James Brown, a local antiquarian before 1870 but apparently after 1864. <clears throat> Brown, who died in 1895, aged 69, was described in an obituary notice as much respected in Salisbury and regretted by many throughout the county of Wilts as a keen and competent archaeologist of singularly modest and unassuming character. He had formed a considerable collection of flint implements, many of which he gave to the Blackmore Museum at Salisbury and also of the weapons of existing savage races. This slide shows the spot at Milford Hill where a chipped pointed flint implement was dug out in the presence of James Brown on June the 13th, 1864. So I suspect that the Brown is the figure seated in the foreground with his best girl. But it's not known where Brown found this capital. And it now appears likely that he simply gave his discovery to Salisbury Museum because he had connections there and it was reasonably local. In any event, it was generally assumed to be from Old Sarum until a remarkably late date, well after the bulk of the Glastonbury cloister material had been excavated. And it's unfortunate that this capital far and away the most complete and best preserved of all the stones should have misled art historians into a false attribution for so long. It's the surviving half of a freestanding double capital of full height and including large parts of two faces. And uh, later on you'll see other views of it that show bits of other faces. These are carved with similar designs with lion masks at the upper angles from whose mouths issued pairs of stems carved with zigzag and beading. Frederick Bly Bond, who excavated the site between 1908 and 1921, published photographs of two pieces of carved blue lias in 1913, describing them as in private hands and probably relics of Hurleywind's church built around 1100. He further reported that a large number of similar stones had been turned up in the course of excavations under the crossing of the Abbey Church and in the surrounding area, and that these were in the custody of the Abbey trustees. He recognized that the two stones illustrated by Richard Warner were of the same order, and noted that the larger stone was built into the stable wall of Abbey House whence it should be recovered that it is perishing from exposure while the smaller showing a horse was lost. He took the view that all this series of liar stones, as a quote, are from a presbytery wall arcade in the earlier church whose eastern limit probably came under the central tower of the later church. More fragments of blue liar sculpture were recorded in 1927 when Theodore Fife was digging at the west end of the church and where finds included some fragments of blue lyre shafting and carved work which correspond with the fragments in now in the Abbey Museum ascribed to Hurleywind's church. <clears throat> Between 1951 and 64, the excavations were carried out by Radford under the direction of a commit committee appointed by the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society and this institution. During this time, Radford published no full reports at all, but when the British Archaeological Association held their annual conference at Wells and Glastonbury in 1978, 
He produced an interim report on the entire sequence of investigations from 1908 to 1964. This, for the historian of sculpture, is rather disappointing since it is structured as a history of the Abbey and is strongly biased towards the pre-Romanesque period. All that is said about the Romanesque Blue Lyre sculpture is that it is fine in detail and dates from the later years of Henry of Poir's Abbacy. And he illustrated it with a photograph of S519, the stone described by Richard Warner and dug up before 1826, rather than anything he'd excavated himself. It's clear from the archaeological record that carved fragments from Henry's cloister were being excavated in various parts of the site from 1908 onwards, and that many of them were excavated between 1952 and 1957 by Raleigh Radford, who was digging in the cloister area at that time. Unfortunately, detailed records of find spots are not available for every stone. And in fact, of the 51 blue lyre stones that look Romanesque, only five have a specific archaeological context, and just one of these belongs with Henry of Blair's cloister group. That's this one, S635, part of a capital including its necking and intersecting stems decorated with the typical beading and zigzag ornament. It was found in the cloister in 1957, although no more precise context is supplied. Two other stones are known to have been excavated by Raleigh Radford in 1957, but no excavation spot was recorded. These are S521 and S522. Both belong to the Henry Bois Cloister group, and indeed are strikingly and striking enough to be included in the stones on display in the visitors' set. Other stones photographed by Raleigh Radford, certainly or probably in 1952, and assumed to have been excavated by him in that year, are shown on the screen. By the mid-50s, therefore, a large number of blue lyre stones, finely decorated with this distinctive beading and zigzag ornamented foliage forms, had been excavated and placed in the Abbey Stone Store. But at this stage, they had not been associated with Henry of Bois or his cloister. It was at precisely this time that two important and influential books on English Romanesque art appeared. And from their author's point of view, the timing could not have been much worse. The capital in Salisbury Museum was well established, it seems, as high-grade work from Old Serum, while the collection of stones building up at Glastonbury had not yet been around long enough to be the subject of serious study. C.S.R. Bose's long discussion of the Salisbury capital in his English Art 1100 to 1216, written for the Oxford History of English Art series, associated with Bishop Rogers' 1107 to 39 rebuilding of the church, as described in eulogistic terms by William of Malmesbury. <clears throat> Bose assumed that it had come from the old Serum site and identified the stone as blue marble, an ambiguous term commonly used to describe blue-hued Purbeck marble, but equally applicable to Tornai marble. He perhaps clarified his position by describing the capital as admirably carved, with an elaboration of cutting unknown in English work of the period, and probably an import from abroad. George Janetsky made the same assumptions, that it was from Old Serum, and that it was a Flemish import of Tornai marble. He dated it to 1150 to 75, however, divorcing it from Bishop Rogers' work and linking it instead to the time of Jocelyn de Boone. Unlike Bose, Janetsky was familiar with Reeves's pre-1826 discovery and Butler's drawing of it, and he had also seen fragments of marble capitals 
in the Abbey Museum at Glastonbury, all establishing a style very close to that of the old Sarum capital. Unwilling to abandon the old Sarum attribution, however, he concluded that it seems certain that all these capitals were brought to England ready-made from Flanders and used in places widely separated. For the sake of completeness, I must also mention Lawrence Stone's survey of British medieval sculpture that appeared in the Pelican History of Art series two years after the works by Janetsky and Bowes, both of which are cited in his bibliography. Despite including a long discussion of the Tournai marble trade, Stone made no mention of the Henry of Black cloister sculpture, either at Glastonbury or Old Sarum. The major shift in the position of art historians came not from one of the big guns, but from an MA student of Janetsky's called Josephine Turke. Not only did she introduce the, Genetsky, the Glastonbury discoveries into the art historical literature, she also established that the stone was not Tornai but Blue Lias, and concluded that the sculpture was by local sculptors rather than being a foreign import. The Salisbury capital was now described as a Glastonbury capital, taken to Salisbury by its discoverer, James Brown. This is a double capital, of course, found more usually in cloisters than elsewhere. And I, I should interject at this point that one of the parts of this paper that got abandoned when it was cut down from 30 minutes to 20 minutes was a discussion of the, um, of the structure of the, the cloister and whether it was carried on single columns or double columns or a mixture of the two. And what struck me at the time and strikes me now is that it's very simple to identify a fragmentary capital as a double capital if you've got a bit of its necking because you can see what happens to the shape of the necking. It's impossible to identify a fragment as being certainly a single capital. So there's no way of knowing whether any of these bits we've got in the museum are from single capitals, although we can be certain whether they're from double capitals. The arcaded blue liar stone, S759, previously identified speculatively as part of the tomb of Abbot Hurleywin, was proposed now to be part of a lavatory basin by comparison with a similar fragment from Lewis Priory. And this added more weight to the tapestry interpretation. There would have been no major re-evaluation of the importance of this sculpture to the history of the English Romanesque, however, without Genetsky's own direct intervention. And this took place in the blockbuster exhibition of English Romanesque art held at the Hayward Gallery in 1984. Janetsky was the driving force behind the exhibition, and he selected seven of the Blue Lias cloister fragments for display. The sheer volume of Glastonbury material and its prominence at the exhibition and the catalogue, and in the catalogue, marked an important watershed. The Glastonbury material at last took its rightful place alongside the sculptures from Reading, Hyde Abbey, and Norwich as a paradigm of English Romanesque cloister sculpture of the highest quality. 